It starts with the players. They do a good job. Well, I'll start back. Defense making a stop to give us an opportunity to go on punt return because you're guaranteed zero punt returns each game. So defense getting the stop and then uh, players doing a great job of bringing the call to life. The scheme is irrelevant unless, unless the players buy into what we're doing and they play go out there and they execute the assignment. So Hodge did a great job winning up with speed and getting vertical and then it created an opportunity for Richie to come free and take the ball off the punter's foot. So big credit to those guys going out there and being able to execute the plan at the high level and giving our offense great field position. As a coordinator, how does it feel to be uh, have your units contributing this uh, tie for first with two block punts in the league? For our, it's, one, it's, it feels good for our players because we're being able to – we're in a position where we can help with field position. We're a direct reflection and correlation of our offense and defense. Any opportunity that we get D-led on the field to help our offense and defense with field position or creating an extra possession or putting points on the board is critical for us. And that's what we look at day in and day out. What can we do to help our, our team be in the best position? If we could do that each and every play that we get, having that one down mentality D-led, um, we're going to like the outcome. So. It's a big credit to our players and how they go about their business. And, and also you talk about Terry and Coach Smith bringing in the type of players that come in and help us on those phases and those downs. And they understand whether we're talking about starters on offense and defense, backup players, those guys understand that um, that play is important to helping our team win games and putting our team in the best position to win games. I mean, obviously, this is the last time we're going to see you for a while. Uh, how do you judge how you guys did this year, special teams wise? You know, after the season, we'll get an opportunity to go back and watch film and just looking at situational downs, various plays, you know, that we could win, whether it's in, in all six phases, we're always looking to improve. And our challenge this week is to play our best game of the season, which it is each and every week, we're looking to play our best game. So that'll be something that we'll look at this off season where we're looking at our techniques, our fundamentals, um, personnel, schemes, all those different things. And we'll kind of tie that all together moving forward when we get into the off season. But again, Mike, our number one goal is to go out there and put our, put together our best game as a team versus Tampa Bay this weekend. I understand that and I respect that. Yeah. But uh, I mean, you look at where you guys were last year, special teams, yes, sir. to where you are this year. Is there enough pro – have you seen enough progress? Do you believe that there's been enough progress made with what you're trying to build with that unit? Yes. In order to, you know, change a culture and change the mindset of special teams, it doesn't happen overnight. And you only get better with reps. And we're, we don't get a lot of reps on special teams in correlation to offense and defense. So the biggest thing for myself and for our coaching staff on special teams and our players is just to be consistent, stay disciplined, and just trust the overall process of what we're doing. And you expect everybody – a lot of times you see people, they want instant success, instant growth. Where for our, us in our room, we want gradual success and gradual growth. And sometimes it's hard to take it that go that direction, but it makes it worth it in the overall process. So we do like our growth and our process and how we've grown on special teams, but we're still not where we need to be, to answer your question. Where, how do you get to that point? Like, what do you need to see in the off season or do in the off season to get maybe there next year? It starts with me doing the continue. I got to do a better job coaching special teams, coaching techniques, uh, having, our, having our guys have a better understanding of situational ball and the importance of that one down mentality. I'm not saying that it's not fair, but we can always get better at it. And that's the, the mindset that we have. Yes, there are some results that we had on special teams that are very positive. We talk about block punts, touchdowns, big returns, but we don't get fixated on the results. It's the, all the little things, the process, the techniques, our alignment, assignment, um, pad level, all those little things will add to better results. So those are things I have to do a better job of teaching, and I want to continue to do a better job in our staff and then getting our guys to understand it and execute those techniques and fundamentals and understand situational football better. Really quick, um, sorry. Um, some of your key guys on special teams are on expiring contracts. I'm thinking of Hodge and Mike Ford and Bradley Pinion. Are those – Whoever you think fits in, in this system, is that something where you'll make your voice heard? It would be great if 
we could get these guys back because of the bid, whoever they are. I'm not asking you to, to name names, but is that something that during the offseason that you might go and do if you the answer that question is whoever can help us on special teams and and they're in that room or they could be in that room to help us on special teams and they could be an impact player for us and help us in a positive impact. Of course, I'm going to go fight for those guys because we're looking at putting the best players on the field. Just no different than what we're doing on offense, no different than what we're doing on defense. <laughs> we're looking for guys that can help us be in the best position to win football games. So yes, to answer your question, if there's guys that we're looking at personnel-wise and they can help us on special teams, I'm, I will do whatever I can to help put those guys in the best light possible because I know that they can help our team win ball games. When you're looking at, if I can try to separate what I just asked to this, I'm not trying to link them together, no, I no. swear. But, I got but, you. But when you look at what Bradley's been able to do for you, and I, I think it was the last game, right, that punt that bounced out at the, at the one, it just seems like he's been a really impactful player in that battle for, for, for a field position. How would mm -hmm. you grade out his season and his impact on what you guys are trying to do? I try not to grade players right now because we're still – we haven't finished our season yet. But he continues to get better. And I appreciate his process and how he goes about his business and how professional he is and what he brings to the table as a leader and the weapons that he brings to the table as a kickoff guy for us and a punter and a holder. So he has multiple roles that he has, and and he's done a, he's done a really good job for us. And I'm excited to see him go out there this weekend to perform really well versus Tampa Bay. Um, and then once the season ends, that will be something that we'll look at, his overall grade. And not like we're not grading guys now, we're not evaluating. Each and every week we are. But that's something I want let him to get, let him get his full body of work. Because remember, he's only been here since, what, July, August? So he hasn't been here that long. But it feels like when you get into the season, he's been here for a while. So those are things we'll look at after the season and continue to work on that. Um, overall evaluation process moving forward. Scott asked about Mike Ford. You look around to more of the special teams are way like New England, Pittsburgh, they have that one guy that's like special teams guy. I mean, do you envision Mike being that for you potentially long term? Like, is that how you see it? I just see Mike as a player that plays with great energy, effort, he's passionate. Plays, he has unmeasurable speed when he's out on the field, um, and he's a selfless player that looks to help the team in any way possible. And just so happens, special teams right now is his platform that he's using because that's where he plays all his reps on his own special teams. So that's how I view Mike as an as a overall player and how he is as a leader in that special teams room. Leading by example, being vocal, being selfless, like I said before. And... He is an impact player in that, that way when it comes to special teams. Now, it just so happens his reps are on special teams. All his reps are on special teams. I know teams do have those, like, special teams corner. Slater's a special teams receiver. Uh, me as a coach, I don't try to limit guys to they're just a special teams individual when it comes to the answer to your question. So I, I don't want to put that title, and I won't put titles on players saying, hey, he's a special teams corner. He's just a special teams player. Because he's a player that just so happens – He's playing on offense and defensive phases on special teams. That's his, those are his reps. I, I guess what I was getting at more is that, like, with the Matthew Slater or whatever, like, that gets burned into their, like, their football identity, mm -hmm. we'll call it as well. I mean, and from talking to Mike, it seems like he's good with that. Like, I, I was just wondering if that, he's the type of guy that you could see being, you know, a guy that could be around for a while in that role for you as, as that type of leader. It goes back to if guys can help us on special teams and they're impactful in that way on special teams, which that's what I coordinate. Yes, I love to have players like that that are impactful and they play with great energy and they understand the importance of special teams. But I'm never going to limit and label a player to this is what he does and this is all that he does. Because if he gets the opportunity to play on defense, I know he's going to play with great effort and technique and fundamentals and high energy. But that's not my call. My call is that Coach, if he's on special teams, I'm going to put the best 11 guys out there. Do you have a rooting interest for Devin Hester in the Hall of Fame? Do I say that one more time? <coughs> Do you feel like you have a rooting interest for Devin Hester's Hall of Fame candidates? Like, am I rooting for him? Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. One of the best to ever do it, if not the best to ever do it. He changed the game of special teams. He really changed the way people view special teams in the return game and how the coverage of a particular player. You had a game plan. Offense and defensively, you game plan 
based on if Devin Hester was on that team, when you talk about the Chicago Bears, even when he's playing for Atlanta, even when he's playing for Baltimore, those were things where, as a returner, where you're trying to limit reps of him touching the football based on offense and defense correlating that to special teams. Like, teams would change how they attack certain defenses and move the change based on not putting themselves in a position to punt the ball to 23. So I'm always, yeah, I'm rooting for him and, you know, I wish him nothing but the best because he changed the game as a returner. And that's very, very hard to do. And that's a rare trait to have. Do you consider it a, a mark of progress for the special teams community, for lack of a better term, if he, or for the respect that special teams gets, if he does get in? I think it is. It brings awareness <laughs> to the special teams world of you can change a game based on one play. And it goes back to you're only guaranteed a kickoff and a kickoff return. And for an individual to change the game in that way with limited reps, because you could go on punt return, but there's various different types of punt returns. Are you punting the ball from the 50, where it's going to be an inside to 10 punt? Or are you punting the ball from, you know, fourth and, you know, fourth and 20, where it could be a flip the field and the ball's on a minus two and you have opportunity. And then it's the coach giving the call. Is he calling the return? Is he calling the rush? So there's a lot of different variables. And for a guy like Devin Hester to still execute and go out there and be an impact player in that way, yes. I mean, it, it brings a lot of awareness to one player being able, how long we had players that helped him, but a player to have the ball in his hands and to make plays like that and change the game, I think it brings a lot of awareness. Do you think that if Hester gets in, that opens the door for Cordero? But yeah, I think it's an opportunity for it does open. He's, he's the all-time leading kickoff returner. I think it does open the door for special teams players in general when it comes to a guy like Hester. I mean, doing doing what he's done for the years that he did it for, and I'm excited, and hopefully he does get in. Right. I, I guess it's maybe a little bit more specific. To Just for the returners. Because of the returns and, and kind of how both of them, their careers have been defensively for Devin, obviously. For yeah. Cordero, I was really wondering if you kind of see that as a real clear path. When it's all said and done, when CP decides to hang it up down the road, you know, those are things that, yeah, of course, we would like to see him. I will, I'm rooting for him as well down the road. And, um, Coach, uh, the 22 categories that we rate at the end of the year, I haven't got through all of them, but I'm expecting that you all will be um, a, a lot better than 23 this year. Um, where are you since that you all might come out in the, the, the special teams rankings for the year? Don't. Because your returns are up, you got the blocks, um, start position is one. Uh, but uh, yeah, the ones I've checked, you. I thought all, you were going to name them all right now. Oh, great. no, I, I, could, I got them. <laughs> I got them out here, but I haven't checked all 22. But everything is up. Rankings. To me, rankings, that's irrelevant. Wins and losses. Can we help our team win games? Did we win that down? So at the end of the season, when we're looking at evaluating our special teams plays. How many plays did we win? How many plays did we lose? And how can we win the plays that we lost? Those are things that we're looking at, not fixated on rankings, not fixated on stats. I mean, we do look at certain stats that help us, like we talk about returns, 10 or more yards, 20 or more yards, and how that correlates to us scoring points. Those are things that we look at. Yeah. But though, no, that's. Yeah, there's, game, there's, there's some things that are correlated to winning, but you could have a top rated. I've been on teams that have top rated special teams, and we won four games. Yeah, it, but what can we do better on special teams to help the, help that team, help the offense, help the defense? There's strong correlations to that, mm -hmm. and it's our job as special teams coaches and, and the special teams players that do a better job, mm -hmm. and, and that's going to be our goal this week and moving forward. And then on the rookies, AK, Troy, and uh, Malone, uh, can you speak to their contributions to your units this year? It's been great having all those young men on, on our special teams. They've been working their tail off day in and day out, being detailed. There's no shortcuts on success. They come in, they get in the extra time, extra film session, um, techniques before or after practice, during practice. And it's a big um, compliment to those guys because they're they're working at it. And you can only get better reps, and there's no shortcuts, like I said before. So and they continue to lead by example. And in our room, whether you're a rookie, first-year player, eighth-year player, leaders build leaders. And we look at all those guys of leading by example, and they're doing a good job of that. Compared to a season 
go with. I was specific adjustments have you seen Avery Williams make as a player that's made him like so efficient in the punt return, punt return game? I think it's decision making. Overall decision making, not swinging at every pitch. You, you could return every single ball, but you're probably going to put your offense in bad field position or probably put your defense back on the field. So I think his overall decision making and, and his overall understanding of what the punter and what the coordinator or the punt team is trying to trying to execute or what they're have, being a step ahead of what they're trying to do that particular week. You look at the return that he had for 56 yards versus Cincinnati, he did a great job of fielding a short punt. It was a bad punt down the middle, 37 yards low hang time urgency to go catch the ball so he could go make a play. And those are things like Devin Hester. That was one thing that was pretty cool when I did a training camp in 2013 with the Bears, watching how Devin Hester had urgency to get underneath the football, to catch the ball, to be in a position where he could be a triple threat. And those are things that Avery continues to work on day in and day out. And that's not a surprise on why he's averaging that many yards on a punt return. Okay, I'm uh, just checking in on uh, we we're not going to see you next week. Uh, on, um, you know, the rookies not named Desmond Ritter that play offense. That's Drake and Taylor. Tyler. Mm -hmm. How's their season? They're yep. through 16 games. Yeah, what I think, you know, since I've been up here all season about the different uh, processes of young players and, and veteran players, but for us, right, it's the maturation process of the player, and it's just not the physical. Mm -hmm. It's the ability for them day in, day out, and it is a grind mm -hmm. for, for young guys to come in. It's a grind for older players. Right? You know, if you went back to when we first even started OTAs, mm -hmm. then you get the break and then training camp. If I'm not mistaken, we started training camp July 25th, and we're in January of the next year. Um, and so with us, for the players, it's, it's making sure they understand that once you feel a certain level of resistance, either physically or mentally, there's a push through point and once you get through that, you're just building essentially your stamina. And for young guys, you know, it seems as if, you know, their buddies are who are still in college, like they're done playing or whatever, and it almost feels like your body needs to reset. And it's, it's us as coaches making sure that we explain the whys to them, um, continue to push them. And you can see with the, the young players that we have, just like the, whoever lines up for us in offense, we count on them. Uh, no different than this Sunday. And uh, Schaefer and Fitz, they've been, you know, uh, just, you know, practicing and so forth. Have, well, have you seen anything? Uh, yeah, I mean, they, they – Like draft picks. There? Coming back in, being able to practice with us, um, you know, we got to stop having them wear their Georgia Bulldogs outfits instead of the Falcons sometimes. But remind them they're, they're in the NFL. But, no, they've been good about that. The, the, re the reality is, right, those guys are coming in. They're – every time they line up, right, they let us experience. Regardless if it's game or practice, uh, no different for those two. And uh, hopefully this week continues for him and we see progress uh, for the remainder of the season. Feel like you're Hold on, Dila, is that, is that it for 2022? Oh, no, no, I'm not going to let the okay. lose. He's catching his breath. My goodness, man. <laughs> that was the swan song right there. Final question. I would not, I lost the. Uh... Play well with others here. Okay. Do you guys, do you guys have an over under? Like, no, no, I just thought, like, okay, what's the final D leg question? Schaefer or Fitzpatrick? I, would, I didn't see it coming I wasn't that way. I'm sure if you were, uh, Eugene yeah, no. and Art had, like, an over under no, no, no. of how many questions. No, no, no. Okay. No, no. Just one. Do y'all feel like your evaluation of Desmond was hurt <coughs> or taken away from by in any way because Kyle wasn't here? He's been such a big part of what you do. You haven't been able to see him again. Oh, that's a good question. I don't, I don't think we looked at it. I, I can't speak for anybody else but myself, right? From the evaluation process for, for Desmond, um, it's, like I said before, it's not just, hey, how are we operating at the visitor stadium on third down? It's how are we operating on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the practice week into Friday? How are you handling your body? What is your um, communication with your teammates? And so for me, regardless of who's out there, right, we run a lot of personnel regardless of who's healthy and who's not. Right? We try to put maximum stre stress pre-snap on the defense to allow the offense to have an advantage before the ball snap. And so for us, and for myself in particular, with Desmond, any young players, you want to see their ability to handle as much mentally as possible. Physically, right, that's what the fundamental periods are for in practice, right, to push these guys physically through. But again, you don't know a guy's capacity until you push it mentally, and specifically at the quarterback spot, right? You like to think that guys can handle a lot, but the reality is most feel comfortable in a certain amount, and then once you push them over that, they may never have been pushed that hard mentally, and therefore there's pushback.
But you have to find that out as a coach because the further you can stretch a quarterback's mind in terms of pushing him mentally and what he's seeing and how he's going to react to something, typically the further you can push him physically because now, right, there's no resistance. Because sometimes the mind takes over, right? And it's the same telling the body, hey, we're good. I'm overloaded. But you have to get to that point, right, with every quarterback, regardless of experience, to see exactly where you can go with them. Um, and then once you realize that as a coach, you have to make the declaration as a coach, can I go further, right? Can I, I, used to been, I was told this a long time ago as a player, right? A coach's responsibility when he becomes a coach is to push a player further mentally or physically than that player thinks he can go then you accomplish your job as a coach. So that is always, right, the testament. You're going to push them, but you also have to realize there's a point where you push them too far, you might have lost them. And that's the art of it, right? And that's, that's the finding out process with any of our players, regardless of age, um, no different than the quarterback if we're talking about the left tackle. So that's also part of, the, of, of his evaluation as well for us. Do you want him thinking this is option A, B, C, and B, or does he? Do you want him understanding that's Kyle Pitts on my second read, or that's Drake London, and there are certain guys. Sure, I think when you when you put together the plan in mind, right? There's obviously for us, we want to see what guys do well, highlight that, put those guys in those positions. In terms of the reads of the quarterback, in my history, <laughs> one man's opinion. <laughs> When you begin to force an outcome, which means I'm only going to throw it to this guy or I'm only going to look for this guy, what typically happens, not 100%, D-Led, you're going to get me on this, but what typically happens, you become tunneled. And so now, right, instead of seeing a lot, you see very little. And then all, you're, you're forcing things and nothing natural is happening within the system. What you love to see is when the, the ball is being spread out and then all of a sudden, right, for instance, like on that – Cordell Patterson play last week where he throws what I consider the best ball of the game for him, which was the back shoulder throw. Now, I know it didn't you know, go our way. But what he saw there, right, on the same page with a veteran player, to be able to diagnose, right, has a read here, has an overriding read here, and takes it and then knows what kind of ball to throw, that's not a forced outcome. That was, hey, that situation, the appearance I got from the defense told me hey, that's a pretty good look. And then he was able to go there and, make, and try to make a play there. To me, that's good quarterback play. Just to go back and say, hey, I'm going to throw it to this guy only, I think you get in trouble. Now, people will argue in critical situations. I was told this by another longtime coach. In times of crisis, think players, not plays. And there is, that is real, right? When you're sitting there going, all right, man, I need to make a play here, right? In critical situation, either design tells you to go there or you're like, hey, I'm going to my guy. And I think that develops with trust and over time. But I think if you go and approach that all the time, I think that becomes where quarterbacks all of a sudden lose their way. And therefore, when you lose your vision as a quarterback and you become like this, like it's really hard to find it back. So the guy is no different than when you have an aggressive mindset as a quarterback and all of a sudden we tell you to be conservative all the time, like it's hard to play both. No different than when you're a really conservative quarterback and we're telling you to take shots all the time. It's hard to reprogram. So you just have to be careful from the programming standpoint. And you want guys to have a natural feel for it. And you don't want to take that away. Because I do think at times at the position, you can overcoach it. You've been playing the position since whatever age. There's instincts that go with the position. You can be coached out of instinct and become robotic. And that's a goal specifically for myself. And I never want to, I know no coach will want to do that. But for me in particular, I don't want to make a guy non-instinctual. I don't know if that answered any of it. I mean, it's a long-winded. <laughs> I, I go and people are falling asleep in the back, which I appreciate. But yeah, whatever you can take. That might have been your longest answer of the season. You think so? I think it might have been. End of the year, I'm just letting it all out at this point. <laughs> but yeah. let's keep going. Let's go. uh, <laughs> Last question. We good? Here we go. Uh, in all, in all seriousness, though, like, have you? Do you feel like you've seen enough from Desmond to know? Well, I think we have another game, right? And I think what we have is when you look at sample size of players, look. I don't know if there's a perfect science to, hey, he played this many snaps, he's played this many games, oh, I've got the evaluation. Because I think guys grow at different rates. I've been around young quarterbacks that it clicked right away. I've been around young quarterbacks that it's clicked later and been around young quarterbacks that never clicked at all. But you keep waiting because you're like, hey, there's this amount of games. 
just no different than when you're evaluating a quarterback coming out of college. What's the right number of games he's supposed to be playing? Is he a one-year, two-year, three-year, four-year starter? Oh, that's the key, right? There's metrics for everything, but there's always outliers. And so for, for Desmond, what I see is this. First start, away, division, rival, at New Orleans, chance to go win it in an in a, in a environment we have to go win. Next game, at Baltimore, playoff team, right? Ball in his hand. We have four opportunities in the red area. We obviously did not do what we needed to do but kept us in a football game towards the end. Last week against another very good defense. When you look at these defenses, they're all presenting different challenges now. And now you and, – and what they do in Arizona, I have a lot of respect for because they do try to make it hard on the quarterback. They do try to feel like he's got pressure coming at him. And how does he handle that? Now, it's no different this week now, right? He's going into an environment. Todd Bowles is a guy I played probably six times in the last four years. And he's a guy who has his defense, regardless of who's out there and who's not, he adds different pieces each year. But you can see the intent and the style in which they play. It's not easy on a quarterback. They're a top 10 pass defense for a reason, regardless of who he puts out there. And so, you again, you get another measuring stick for how is he going to be this week. And again, I think when you look at evaluations, there's always variables that you take into consideration, and there's always weights that you put on them. But for me, what you want to see is how is he going to handle the week? How is he going to handle the final week of the season? How is he going to handle his teammates in terms of communication? And then you want to see where he is when the game and the ball snapped. And then when you settle it all down, we have time to take a breath. You want to reevaluate because you're in it right now. You're game planning right now, but you want to take a step back and you want to see the picture for what it is. And then obviously the evaluations will occur. But for me right now, the focus has been on, let's go out, let's put your best foot forward and understand your issues this week. And after a walkthrough right now, it seems like he's there. But again, there's a lot more practice to, to be had. What do you need to see from Drake in the offseason? Like what, what, when he leaves next week to go back to California or wherever, what, what do you sure. see? Like, hey, by May, we want to see, we, we want or need to see X for you to take the step that you believe. Right. I think when it comes to a, a player's first offseason, and I'll just go back to my experience, right? Since when guys declare, think about the process they go through. You find an agent. You go somewhere and you go work out, probably not your house, near your home. Now, right, you got combine, you got pro day prep, you go to the draft, you're going to a city that you've never probably either been to or spent much time at, and now you have to go find a life there. And that takes you into OTAs, and then you have a time off and takes you to training camp. It is an absolute sprint your first year. And then the season stops, and then you're gone. Right, then you have a break. So for Drake, right, or any young player, there's going to be a process in which he probably needs to step away. Right, he's been going, and then when he comes back, or when he's able to start getting himself going again in terms of getting himself in shape and everything else, right, what you want to be able to do when he comes back is watch the tape with him, and let's truly evaluate the routes. And it's going to be our job as coaches, right? What does he do well? Where does he need to improve? Where can we help him schematically? And then fundamentally. But I think more than anything else, to answer your question, take a breath. Take a breath. And then when you come back in, like, let's work together. Like, we'll have a plan, right? You obviously will come up with things you want to work on. And then let's make sure that we reach those goals after we've been together now for a year. I think that's the most important thing is communication. But to say, hey, you're only going to do this because I told you. I don't think that's fair to the player. Because I think the player knows, it, knows themselves better than some coaches think. And so it's, it is part of that evaluation and communication. Gosh, no, that, that, okay. that's, that's, I mean, um, I, I, I can always tell by your body language. You're like, hey, wrap it up, kid. Like, no. I already got this. Hey, like, two you years now. Two years. Like, job, rubbing his face. Like, it's. When, all right. Um, now I'm just messing with you guys. You, you read too much into the You think so? I think so, a little bit. I think it's because you were a radio host. It's the hand. Could be anything. It's the hand. Right? Or maybe it's the hand. You think so? Who talks with their hands more, Michael or Arthur? Well, look, I'm an Italian. Wait, we talk with our hands. All the time. I'm, just, I'm holding here like I don't know what to do, right? I want to move, and it's like, yeah. Who talks more, you or Arthur, with your hands? Let me evaluate in the off season, right? Pick up the right tackle for a second. Um, do you think that 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 uh, that uh, Caleb's play has elevated this year, and if so, what has Cause that in sure. Case. Yeah, I think with you know, you look at Caleb, and you know, I know I was answering questions last year about the offensive line and run game and everything else. And I think what you've seen 
this year and what makes you so excited about what they were able to do and still have a game left here, right, is the, the way they're in sync with each other. So the nonverbal communication and the way they're coming off the ball, but more importantly, the why. I think when you put a new system in and you have a new position coach and they're trying to feel those things out and they want to know where they stand, I think there is a feeling out process. What, you, what I see up front, regardless of position, is I see a trust in their position coach and the scheme. And when you see that, you get guys to play fast, regardless of what position you're coaching. If that player believes in what they're doing, ultimately you see guys play fast. And it's no different from the right tackle to whoever's been at left guard to obviously the other adjustments we made up front. Um, I mean, for Caleb's standpoint, you love the way he comes off the ball, the physicality, um, his mindset. And there's always room for improvement, not just for him, but for everybody else. But you see a willingness to want to work. I think that's the one thing that goes sometimes unsaid in the NFL is, you know, these guys, regardless of paid or not, like their capacity to want to get better. And it's no different from other positions, but really the guys up front. You can see it every day. You can see in their individual. You can see in their meeting rooms. You can see the way they play. And there's, a, there's definitely a, um, a pride in which the intent in which they play. And you appreciate that as, and from my position or if I was a position coach, to see that group. What's been the one thing that stands out the most about Chris Lindstrom? Well, I think the speed in which he plays. I mean, um, he's a very good athlete, but he has not just quickness off the ball, but he can strike you. Um, he understands what we're trying to accomplish. He also understands the intent of the play. And he'll understand the weakness of what he's trying to protect in terms of the play scheme. And so smart football player, plays the right way in terms of his physicality and intent. And um, yeah, I have, just like the rest of the guys, from, from Jake to Drew to Caleb, um, to anybody who's played left guard for us, you love the way that they, they play for each other up front and they play for the other players on the offense. Because they also know, right, they'll be the first to tell you when it comes to run game and pass pro, I guarantee if you ask them, they'll say it takes all 11. And they really appreciate that. And it takes, and they take that motto and they, and they have pride in it. Seems like Kyler's getting more and more comfortable. He, I mean, he's kind of, you talk about playing free with quarterbacks. Sure. He's, he's being patient. He's doing little nimble things. He's yeah. knowing when to be aggressive. Um, is that just a product of time? Or yeah, I think it's a product of time, experience, and confidence, right? Going out there, continuing to do it, realizing that, um, you know, every time he steps on the field, he has a chance to improve. I love his mindset, just like the other young players that we have. Um, and I don't see any reason why he wouldn't continue to improve. Is this it, D-Line? Uh, yeah. Drop we'll the ball right here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, they're already talking about uh, meeting uh, and working out together, Fitz and uh, Tyler and, uh, and Desmond. Um, and I guess Drake will join at some point. Um, do y'all give them like, hey, we will work on slants, work on nine routes? Do you, yeah, uh, I think what you want, that's a good question. They'll work on what they want to, I guess. Yeah, I think what, what no, Matt used to do that. in my experience, when those work the best is when it's organic. Okay. Where the, whoever's the leader, let's say it's a quarterback and he has the reason why, and then therefore, right, he has, it's, he comes up with it, it's because of him, and those guys gravitate toward him. No different than what we want guys to do during the season. Take it over, mm -hmm. own the offense. Mm -hmm you know, be an extension of the coaching, but, but really that would be in a perfect scheme, perfect world, that would be the situation there. Uh, we'll see after the season. What, what for you weighs into that decision? Uh, but be, be between me and my wife. How did you see uh, Isaiah Oliver play at the safety position? Uh, he played one of the best defensive back games I've been around. He had a hell of a game. And between signing a sack, a tackle for loss, a couple of PBUs. I mean, playing two different positions, playing nickel, playing safety. Uh, I told him the other day, I said, I've you know, obviously been around a long time, had a lot of DBs and stuff. That was as good a performance as a defensive back as I've been around in a long, long time. I was really proud of him, especially from where, you know, coming back from injury and stuff like that. Just couldn't be prouder of the guy. You have a lot of guys who are coming up on expiring contracts. I mean, Isaiah is an example. Evans, like, there's a bunch of heavy contributors um, who have uncertainty <coughs> this year. Are there guys that you may go to personnel or the front office and say, "Hey, this guy fits. Let's consider 
and for a longer term? Well, I think that's something personnel will come to me about, not me going to them. Um, I don't, first of all, I don't know anything about contracts. I don't know who's in their last year of contracts. I don't know how much they're getting paid. Don't know if they're minimum contracts or a lot. I don't know, don't care, never have. So I, I couldn't even tell you who's in the last year of their contract or who's going to be restricted or unrestricted. Um, I just really have no idea. So basically, you know, usually at the end of the season, you get together afterwards. Coach will make that decision, Coach Smith, Terry, and those guys will decide, okay, then give us, and we'll make an evaluation of, you know, we'll write up an evaluation at the end of the season on every player. You know, what I think and when goods, bads, and different. Um, and then they usually will come to you and say, is this a guy that still fits what you want to do and all this kind of stuff? And, and then it's yay or nay. So it's, it's, it really isn't up on me or any of the coaches. It's up to us to give our evaluation after they determine. Because they, you know, there's money involved. And so there may be, we don't want this guy back because of the money situation. I don't know. That, but to me, that's something I never want ever my opinion to ever be based on that. I don't care whether you're getting paid $200,000 or you're getting paid $2 million or $20 million. I don't care. It, that is not my job. My job is how do you fit, how do you play, and how do you fit in the system. That's a, I don't care if you were a seventh-round pick, free agent, first-round pick. That should never be anything that I have anything to do with or care about. I've had a ton of free agents, college free agents play for me and start and play well. And so it's my, my job to just evaluate them and how they fit in the scheme and do they fit in the scheme and do you think they played well enough to get you to where you want to go. That's my evaluation. Coach, could you discuss the development of the uh, rookies? Um, Arnold, Troy, um, Malone, and Horn? Uh, I think all of them have done, done, uh, done well. Uh, is there anybody that's played great? No, they're in, but they're in the, I haven't coached great either. So it's just I'm saying not, none of us have done great or we wouldn't be sick wins. So, um, but I think they've all done well as rookies. I think they all have developed. I think they've all gotten better, and that's what you're asking for. You, are they better now? than they were at the end of the season. And I think you can see that. I think that's indicative of the defense. I would think you would say that the defense is playing better now than we did at the beginning of the season. So that's indicative. And we're playing the same guys. Mm -hmm. So they, I think they've all improved. Rookies and just defense in general have improved. You see upside in most of them? No, uh, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah they're, they're all good draft picks. Yeah. And some of, them, some of them weren't even draft picks, I think. No, I don't no, no. So, but. But um, I think well, whether they were draft picks or whether they were free agent signings, uh, they were all well done by our uh, pro department, scouting department, um, and Terry and, and the administrative guys. They, they all did a good job of picking good players. When you got here, uh, you know, soon after Arthur got here, part of what you and Arthur were trying to do was build a culture and build kind of a basis for this defense. How do you feel like that? Two years out, two years out now, how do you feel like that's gone? Oh, I think it's gone well. I think it's indicative. Again, I think if we were playing the same now as we played at the beginning of the year or last year, then I would say then it hasn't gone like expected. But you guys tell me if you think we're playing better or we're not playing better. In my eyes, we're playing a lot better than we played the first half of the year, a lot better. So um, it's trending in the right direction, and isn't that what you want? You, you know, if it's, if it's not trending at all, that's not good. And if it's trending in the opposite, that's bad. So I'm just saying I think it's trending in the right direction. And so when that is the case, I think, yeah, the culture, I love the way our guys play, the way that our guys prepare. That's part of the culture. You want guys that take it serious. It means a lot to them. They practice hard. They play hard. Do I always have the most ability? Maybe not. Doesn't really matter. Are you playing hard? You know, I always said, you know, the, the, what you need to know is, is you, you got to be smart, you got to be tough, and you got to know what to do. God gave you the ability to do all those. God granted some people more ability athletically than others. I wasn't one of those guys he was looking at when, when he granted, when he was handing that stuff out. So, but the one thing I've always done is pride myself in is working hard, giving the greatest effort I could, knowing what to do, trying to be, do this, the right thing and giving it everything I have and be loyal. And that's what you want to look for in a player. 
Now, when you get that plus a guy that's got great ability, you got a, you got a Hall of Famer or a Pro Bowler. That's what you got. So uh, I have no complaints about these guys. I think the culture is definitely going in the right direction. Same with me, by the way, on that list of athletic ability chart. Yeah. <laughs> Did not go well. Uh, well we all were. Right? That's why we're doing what we're doing. <laughs> kind, of, kind of following on that, though, uh, you know, as you said, you'll see after the season and you're going to talk with your wife. How much does where this defense is now play into some of that, whether you decide to come back or not? It, right at this point in time, I'm, I'm happy with the way the defense is playing. That, that won't. It, it'll be uh, – it, there's a lot of things. It, there's a lot of things involved. It's hard to say. When you're 73 years old, there's a lot of things at play. So, uh, you know, we'll make that decision, and it will not be just my decision. It will be a family decision. When you look at how A.J.'s played this year, how do you, how do you judge that? Uh, I think good. That's why we match him up on some of the best receivers every week. And, you know, if we didn't think he was playing at that level, we wouldn't do that. And – um, the thing of it is with that, there's sometimes you look and he doesn't get targeted as much. But then when he does get targeted, it's like, let's say he only gets targeted three times in a game, but one of them's a catch. So it looks like percentage wise, well, geez, you know, it doesn't look as good. Um, but he's always playing on the best receiver. So um, that you always got to weigh that stuff into account that, yeah, he didn't get targeted a lot in this. Sometimes we didn't match him up, whatever. Um, but I think he's played well. I think he's, he's played well. And when you're asking a guy to take on the best guys, what I like is the fact that he longs for that assignment. He likes it. He wants to be that guy. And that's what you want. You want, you want a corner, hey, yeah, give me that dude. So, um, so we do. And with Rashawn, you brought him in this offseason. He knows your defense very well. How do you feel like he's fit into what great. you guys asked him? Absolutely about? great. I, you know, I love Foyer. Thought he did a great job for learning a new system and really and it obviously paid off for him financially. <laughs> uh, but Rashawn came in and not missing a beat. Felt like we had the same thing and I think we've even taken a step ahead. And he's, I love Rashawn. He's, he's everything that I knew I had in Tennessee, and he was everything when he got here. I'm not the least bit disappointed in him whatsoever. I'm, I'm very, very proud of him. This is kind of a hypothetical, going back to the evaluation process. If personnel comes to you, and they may or may not do this, and say, okay, we've got, I've got the perfect player at all three levels. I've got a perfect defensive lineman. I can, I can take a perfect linebacker or a perfect DB. <coughs> what do you want? Yeah. What's your answer to that question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 All three. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, it, it's really always hard to say because the two the two areas that you're, you know, it's it's hard for me to say which one, but there's you always want a pass rusher because that it's a passing league. You, you're always going to want a pass rusher, but you also got to be able to cover them back there. And if you can't play man coverage, it, it gets old after a while trying to play all these different zones to cover up because you can't play man. So in some ways, to me, I'd rather have a, a cover guy. Um, I can manufacture some pressures, not that I want to. I'd rather four-man rush and sack the quarterback. But if I have to manufacture something, I can manufacture pass rush in some ways better than I can manufacture a guy covering. And, you know, it's just it, – it, but that's – it's it's really arbitrary. I mean, it, I'm not – Certainly wouldn't pass up a dynamic pass rusher or, wouldn't, or a dynamic defensive lineman either. You know, if you got a guy like a J.J. Watt or somebody like that that also can – or, um, you know, Donald, Aaron Donald or a guy like that that can just wreck havoc inside, that's the same as an outside. Everybody thinks outside pass rushers. Well, those two guys wreak havoc inside just as much. Any of those guys, uh, it's just – it's hard to it's hard to say, but but the the problem with part of the question is that you got two different facets that you're dealing with. You got draft and you got free agency. So what you should be able to do both because one of them hopefully you one side of it you can get in the draft and one side of it maybe you can get in free agency. So it's not like okay, well you only got one choice. 
that's well, the last, that was the choice in this last two years with the cap problem. That's really is not to me should not be the problem necessarily going forward because you still got a draft and we're going to have a fairly high pick. Doesn't mean we're going to take a defensive guy first round, but you're going to have some high picks. And then the other thing is now you got a little bit of cap money. Now you got a chance to maybe go get a free agent. So if you don't get the one in one, hopefully you can get the one in the other so you can get two. The problem that, that Art had and Terry had to me in the last couple of years, and it, you, you had you had one, and it was probably going to be draft because you didn't have any money to go get a free agent. So uh, hopefully that's not the case. Any thoughts on the pass rushers that were finalists for the Hall of Fame name yesterday? Uh, Freeney, Allen, and Demarcus Ware. And Robert yeah, Matthews. Which, which, on. which one you want to pick? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're 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 all going to end up in someday. Yeah. That, you know, usually those nominations are one guy's going to get in, but they're they usually that's a hint that somebody's going to get in. Uh, who was the other one? You had Freeney. You got Freeney, Jared Allen, and Freeney first <coughs> time. Uh, Allen and Ware are returning. So they're all. Group and outside is Mathis and uh, John Abraham. Yeah, they're both. I mean, those guys are all great dudes. Uh, I put Suggs in that category too. Yeah. He, but yeah, once he's done it. So I'm just saying that you know, there's there's some guys. The guy that always got me about Mathis was how small he was and how little he was. But that's the way Harrison was too. You know, I mean, I had him in college and nobody wanted him because he's five foot eleven. But those guys could get underneath you. You couldn't. You know, it was hard for. Actually, the tackles were so big that those guys were underneath them all the time and could turn the corner. Man, I mean, I you know I went against him all the time when he was at Indy. I mean, I didn't on offense, but I'm just saying, watched him. I'm like, holy smokes. You know what Bill used to do with with uh, with him? He he in practice he'd let him line up offsides. Whoever was playing his spot lined up offsides. So so like if you're the tackle, I mean they come guys right there. He's so fast because you couldn't simulate it in practice. I thought it was smart as hell because you couldn't really simulate anybody on the card team coming off the edge that fast. So what he did is he let that guy line up offsides. So those tackles, Matt Light and those guys, I mean, they have to get back fast. I thought that was, that was one of the things Bill did. One of, the, one of the things he used to do, too, is he, he used to drive Tom crazy, was he would have the guys in seven on seven in the card team have tennis rackets. And they would, they would stand there with their tennis rackets. They didn't rush, but they'd stand with tennis rackets like this and move wherever Tom moved because he had to figure out to throw it in between them because it simulated getting the guy's hands up. That's smart stuff. It's common sense stuff, but it's really smart. So that's why Bill is Bill. How about the pick? What's the sort of most interesting, innovative, like that's kind of Star Hits for having a lot of offense? What's the most interesting, innovative thing that you've seen in your you know, decades? Well, I think maybe those, those two things. I mean, it's just, it, it just made sense. You couldn't simulate it, so how, how can I best, you know, simulate it? And, and uh, I mean, a couple things like that. I mean, Bill always had something that he would do and everybody would look at it like what and then i mean and then all of a sudden you look at it and go geez that's, that's really smart that's really smart that's why he is who he is so that those are pretty both pretty innovative i thought i wasn't sure if there's anything other than those two that you're like oh yeah like this guy did this that was like no nah, those are those are probably those are probably the most too so you guys good yeah. all right